This is the Everything 80s Podcast, episode 23, Mad Balls, loved by kids, hated by parents. Hey guys, what's happening? Welcome back to the podcast. I'm Jamie. This is Everything 80s, and we're talking about something you might have forgotten about or were vaguely aware of. I was; These were huge to me, but it's the Mad Balls, which was a set of grotesque-looking um, ball kind of toy combinations. And this episode is just going to look all at them, what, how they were created, kind of the weird story of how they actually developed um, why kids hated or kids loved them, parents hated them. Kind of falls in with that like garbage pail kids sort of thing. This is like the era of gross out based humor and toys and products and properties. So we'll look at everything to do with Mad Balls. Before we start though, if you haven't, make sure you subscribe to this podcast if you want. There's no pressure here. But uh, if you, wherever you get your podcast, I should be there. So where, wherever you like to listen, like Spotify. Um, I Heart Radio, Google Play, Apple Podcasts, whatever. I should be there. Okay, let's go. So what we're looking at here is basically like what do you get when you take a Nerf ball and mix it with a garbage pail kit essentially, as I alluded to. And you've got this sort of grossed out base ball. And they, the Mad Balls were a series of rubber ball toys created by Amtoy in the 80s obviously designed with grotesque appearances. If you don't know Mad Balls at all, just Google it quick and you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Each ball also had an odd name and a theme and the Mad Balls would expand into cartoons, video games, comic books. They kind of spread them everywhere. I remember specifically my parents hating Mad Balls. I think most probably did think, you know, they're thinking disgusting and what, like what the hell was the appeal to them? I also remember them along with Garbage Pail Kid cards being not banned, but discouraged from being brought to my public school. And these were things you had to sort of like hide in your desk. And one of my earliest, earliest birthday memories was having a Mad Balls base birthday and a friend's younger brother accidentally revealing which one they got me. So to a kid, like, I don't know, a, a young boy in the 80s, you couldn't come up with a much better toy. You could throw it. You could bounce it. They were unique. Your parents hated them. They were gross. It's perfect. So ultimately, <laughs> it doesn't even really matter the age. Bodily function-based stuff will always be funny. And it equaled into a pretty great, sort of short-lived, but kind of miniaturely iconic 80s toy. So... Let's look at how they created Mad Balls. They came out in 1985, and as I mentioned, were the creation of Amtoy, which was part of a company called American Greetings. And American Greetings is actually the world's largest greeting card company ahead of Hallmark. They had many div- divisions, and they're responsible for a lot of the most iconic toys of the 80s. One of the divisions they had was, for some reason, called Those Characters from Cleveland. And that sort of subgroup is responsible for bringing us those big things like the Care Bears, the Popples, My Pet Monster, Strawberry Shortcake, the Get Along Gang, Holly Hobby. They really, this division is really like the heavyweights when it kind of comes to 80s nostalgia. But if you noticed, those were primarily based on things girls tended to prefer in the 80s. My Pet Monster was, I have an episode all about the history of that. My Pet Monster was kind of that attempt to capitalize in the boys market by offering a plush toy That was just for boys. So instead of thinking that they were playing with like a teddy bear, it had, you know, blue fur fangs. It had handcuffed chains. It was more to think like you were playing with a toy. That was the impression I had of it. Uh, They're, you know, they're obviously just trying to crack into the the younger male market. And they like they wanted to continue pushing this along with my pet monster. So that was actually a pretty big hit. And then it had the pretty successful cartoon show. So that was working, but what else specifically did boys like? And as usual, ball-related objects and gross-out humor. So anything, like I would said, anything you can catch or throw or bounce is always going to be popular. And then if you can combine something disgusting, all the better. So the in-house designers of Mad Balls were James Elliott, Mark Spangler, Vint Goshner, and Tom Kubler, or Kubler. And they were the first to work on Mad Balls. So they were 
pretty psyched to be able to work on something that was so unconventional and not like the run of the mill kind of toys that they had always designed. So the original concept behind Mad Balls is basically came from the group playing around with the, uh, you know, just different ideas. They're sort of sitting and they're brainstorming. And one of the ideas somehow comes up about that game of passing around something like you would with hot potato, you know, that you have the music playing and the person stuck with the potato and the music stops is out or whatever. And you know, the thing's so hot, you got to move it quickly. So they then started drawing grotesque faces on sketches of potatoes. They thought like, wouldn't it be funny to like look down and see you're holding this gross thing. And they had this unofficial competition to see who could draw the grossest face on the potato. Some of those original drawings would be some of the very first Mad Balls. Somehow, the executives had seen the drawings and realized they might have something sellable here. It, it's always the way it seems to go. It's always the sort of like throwaway random ideas that tend to be big hits. And it's reasons why like uh, Pixar lets all their creative team have all these like moments like um unstructured time where they can just work on anything that catches their mind same thing with 3m they they give their employees this uh i I don't know if they call it like creative time or whatever where they can just sort of like you know nothing sort of off limits just throw things ideas around that's how they came up with the post-it notes during one of those sort of things and same thing with pixar the i think that's where i mean i'm sure there's a lot of characters and ideas i think that's where officially where wally came from or maybe monsters inc i don't know like where they're just given these times to just play around with something that's kind of like off the clock and let their natural creativity go same thing kind of a different example but some of the most classic episodes of seinfeld are ones that were kind of throwaway story ideas so like the writers would always be sitting around and pitching ideas for stories and then you know then they're done and then they'd start talking about their own lives and stories and um, one of the writers one day is talking about this soup place they went to where there was this really high strung, intense guy who ran the place and Larry David's going by and he hears that and thinks, wait, that's actually a better story. And that like led to the soup Nazi episode. And a lot of the classic Seinfeld episodes were just things that happened in real life where the people were just discussing them back and forth. They're like, Oh no, we're not pitching story ideas. We're just talking about whatever. And those tend to be the best things. Cause I don't know, they're more organic or something like that. So that's kind of where Mad Balls come from. And then they release Mad Balls to the world. Uh, in 1985, their immediate hit. I remember seeing these toys and thinking it was like too good to be true. So the original series would include eight Mad Balls and they were made up of the following characters. So they had Screaming Meanie. He was a screaming baseball with a large tongue. Probably, that's probably the one you picture most. There was Slobulus, which is a drooling green creature with one eye hanging out of its socket. You had Arg, a one-eyed blue Frankenstein monster-style creature. had stitching all over his face. You had Hornhead, which was a horn cyclops with a nose ring, which is chained to his ear. Um, There's Dustbrain, is a mummy with rotting teeth and wrinkly kind of teal-colored skin. You had Oculus Orbis, a bloodshot eyeball later sporting a mouth uh, in one of the future um, releases. I'll get to that in a bit. There's Skullface, who was a skull with large eye sockets and sporty sort of tiny red eyes. Big set of teeth, partially exposed brain. Um, There was Bash Brain, who was a red-skinned zombie with a partially exposed brain. A lot of brain stuff going on here. So now if you you really remember your Mad Balls history, you might remember that Bash Brain was originally called Split-Skulled Crackhead. Classic. Unfortunately, Amtoy was not aware that this was a term for a drug user. I don't know how you couldn't know crackhead wasn't a term for a drug user, but so they had to switch that around. So the toys are really hot because they're a real novelty and they're not expensive. That's a big feature there. You could buy a couple at a time. Kids could like afford to buy them with whatever crappy allowance they were on. But they also had a second problem besides being associated with the crackheads if you remember the balls had if you ever had one of these they had some pretty hard parts to them like some really solid hard plastic it wasn't a soft squishy nerf ball like it was at its core but some of the like extending parts were pretty hard and they were causing some legit injuries at kids because they'd be whipping them at each other i remember at my school we would play this game called red ass where it might be under another name (laughs) depending where you live 
And I forget how it went. You had the giant like side of the school wall and you had to throw it and catch it. But then if you couldn't catch it on the one hop or you whatever you missed, you had to stand at the wall and they got to whip it at you. And I remember they ultimately they banned that game from our school, not surprisingly. And I remember sometimes trying these with mad balls, but they wouldn't bounce consistently. And they were just maiming kids left and right. Um, yes, <laughs> eventually uh, our school involved almost all ball throwing games. Even if it was like four squares, dodgeball was gone. You could barely even play basketball and stuff like that just because everyone's just getting smoked left and right. Amtoy would n- then move to a more softer foam for the next releases, but the, that first line was pretty damaging. So the second series, if you had any of these, you had characters like Snakebait, which was a forked tongue sort of gorgon. Um, there was a freaky fullback, which is a mutant football player, splitting headache, a monster with the skin on half of his face peeled off. There was Bruise Brother, an ugly biker with a battered blue helmet. There was Wolf Breath. There was a werewolf with large rotten fangs that were dripping blood. There was Fist Face. There was a severed hand clutching an eyeball. There was Swine Sucker, which was just an ugly drooling boar. And you had Lock Lips, which was a creature with its jaw its jaw lock shut and one eye covered by a kind of riveted plate thing. I remember specifically Freaky Fullback as being my favorite. Um, the second series is maybe not as interesting, but for Amtoy, the profit, the profit margins were now becoming massive because these were so cheap to make. And then still, even though they were inexpensive to buy, the, like the markup on them was huge. So they're making a fortune on these things. Then they would put out a actual sports baseballs, balls, if you remember these at all. And they were called the Super Mad Balls. And it included, you know, legit actual balls, uh, but with their twist on it. So they had a football, like American football called Touchdown Terror, a soccer ball called Goal Eater. I think we had that one. And there was a basketball called Foul Shot. And these are just all awesome names. They would also release the head popping mad balls. And that would capitalize on the obviously huge action figure craze that's now kind of full steam into the 80s. Um, you know, you have Star Wars starting everything off with well, a, quite a long delay in the release of their first line of toys by Kenner. If you're familiar with, all, you know, your toy history, Star Wars comes out and it's a massive hit, catches everyone off guard. And they before it came out, they were shopping around the idea of who would produce the toys. Just, you know, a simple line. All these companies turned them down except for Kenner. And they decide, I think they were based out of Cincinnati and they, you know, they decide they'll put out this little line of space toys or whatever. And I think the story goes, they're actually going to go somewhere else to sign. But when George Lucas and whoever went that, that company or those people weren't there or whatever. And then they went to Kenner. The fact is a lot of people pass on star Wars, just, you know, there's no telling that it would be a monster hit. And it's so big that it catches them so off guard that the demand for they just they weren't even close to ready with producing any toys. You probably watch this if you watch the toys that made us that um, show on Netflix. They have all this sort of breakdown in the history of the the Star Wars Kenner saga, but they were so kind of caught off guard that they had to do, um, which actually kind of saved them, which seems hugely risky. But they did the infamous empty box campaign. So you would buy an empty box that had sort of a display background, and it was a sort of certificate package thing and you would send in your like whatever proof of purchase in your name and then they would mail out the first few figures when they release like the next summer i think starting in like june or whatever so so for that christmas there was nothing available and they're panicking and they come up with this thing but it does work and then they're able to start obviously like going full steam with it and then you know the next star wars movies aren't coming out until the 80s and then now you've got gi joe and uh, Transformers and He-Man, you know, and everything by 85 is going full on. So Madballs wants to get in on the action figure kind of movement. So they would add a posable body and that had an ejectable head. So you could like launch the Mad Ball off. So, th- you know, th- they would also, again, not surprisingly, they would put Madballs on anything they could, including like pencils, stickers, erasers, lunch boxes, 
then you would find, I remember these very well. You'd find the inevitable knockoffs that we could get at like our kind of equivalent dollar store places. Not that they were called that then, but there, there was ones called Burt balls. There were weird balls. There were spit balls, you know, pretty feeble attempts, but whatever you, any, whenever anything's hot, you got to jump all over it. So that leads into, I mean, most people probably didn't know this or see it. The mad balls cartoon. And I talk about this all the time, but in the 80s, it's basically free reign to produce any type of marketing cartoon tie-in you can. Anything you're watching on TV in the 80s is basically a 22-minute long commercial for a product. And Madballs obviously wants to jump all over that. But they just, I don't know, something happened. They were never able to get a show out on the air that could be used to sell more toys. They they put together a direct-to-home video cartoon um, kind of like a, I'm not even sure how long they were. It was American Greetings parted, sorry, partnered with a Canadian animation company called Nelvana. And the goal was to get a Saturday morning cartoon show um, or a syndicated one, whether it's, you know, the, the prime time of three o'clock to five o'clock after school, or obviously the Mecca and the Holy ground of Saturday morning cartoons. If you get something on there, you're got it made in the shade, but they just, they don't, get it done and then all they were able to do is put out a 122 minute episode in 1986 that was called escape from orb and i honestly think mad balls would have worked perfectly on a saturday morning cartoon like my me myself i would have been all over it and i imagine a lot of kids would but in escape from orb they introduced a female mad ball named freakella who was modeled after sort of the you know the bride of frankenstein and um you can watch this on YouTube if you just look it up, Madball's cartoon, if, um, to have a look. But they, and you know, and they did the smart thing that other cartoon shows do at the time, which is creating a bit of a backstory, which is always good to help sell more toys and build more of a connection and build more of a world. And you know, long before Marvel and everyone was doing that, these companies sort of set the standard for building worlds. And you know, where this is a thing like all these companies are smart to do in the '80s is that idea of backstory. So like instead of just selling a doll, you're selling this doll that comes from a cabbage patch and is born in this cabbage patch that you get to adopt and has its own name and its own identity. Um, Like with the Transformers, it's, you know, a transforming robot is pretty cool, but that on its own, I don't know, compared to the transforming robot that's called an Autobot that comes from the planet Cybertron, who's fighting another race of... Uh, transforming robots called the Decepticons, you know, like, so backstory is hugely important. So in the Madballs cartoon, their story was the Madballs come from this planet orb and they were part of a rebellious rock band that was fighting back against the bad balls who had their tyrannical oppression all over them. What, whatever, you know, whatever you got to do. The second episode they put out was in 1987, and that was called Madball's Gross Jokes. And it was basically a bit of, how would you say it, Monty Python and a bit of, um, depending where you lived, you can't do that on television, if you remember that show, which honestly were two of the greatest shows ever made. Uh, but it just didn't, yeah, I, I'm surprised it didn't push for this thing harder. I think it was more expensive to do animated shows at that time. And and then just the huge amount of competition. So to only put out two shows wouldn't make any, you know, real impact. So here's the future of Mad Balls now. The Mad Balls was definitely more on the fad side, I would say, but they they really tried to keep it going strong. They released a three-issue comic mini series in 1986. Uh kept that going for around 10 issues, then it was canceled. The comics do um What's that one? Oh, yeah, they, they feature the character named Dr. Frankenbeans, which is incredible. There's also the Mad Balls video game, which I don't remember. It came out in 1988 by Ocean Software, but was re- it was only more of like a computer game. It was released for 8-bit, 8-bit home computers like the Commodore 64. We never had one, so that's maybe I wasn't aware of that whole thing. The, you know, Mad Balls would fade away, but they get a revival like most things from the 80s did. Mad Balls were revived by a company called Art Asylum in 2007 and then by another company called Just Play Inc. in, t- in 2017. So Just Play would work with American Greetings to reissue some of those old classic characters 
and then put out some new ones at the same time. So, you know, whenever there's interest, it's worth sort of revisiting that and seeing if it, you know, catches on again, if it sticks or whatever. So I'll start winding it down here. I'd say, I'd say that Mad Balls are definitely like a little blip on the radar of 1980s related toys and pop culture, but they carved out their own little corner and I think they made an impact. You know, myself, I loved them. Other kids loved them. They they made their quick little splash. They took advantage of being the novelty that they were. Um, they still hang around. If you saw Ready Player One, I mean, that epic inclusion of um, a mad ball, which was actually uh, dust brain, was used as the bomb in that the battle scene at the end when they throw it in. Uh, when I saw it, we saw the opening show, that got one of the biggest reactions of the night when we saw it in the theater. It was seeing the mad ball. It was just like someone's like, oh, yeah, you just completely forget. So it was amazing. I think that shows the mad balls that, like, say in Ready Player One, uh, in a movie that's filled with epic nostalgia, mad balls are still able to hold their own. So I think that shows that, you know, they did have a little bit of significance. Okay. So I'll finish that up here. Hopefully you like this episode and learn more about mad balls, or maybe you're like looking around to see if you had one or looking on eBay or, but you can check out those companies like just play Inc now and see what's released. But again, thanks for listening. If you haven't subscribed to the show, if you really like it, leave it a rating and review more people get to see it that way. I appreciate you listening. I mean, there's so many podcasts out there, so hopefully you're enjoying this one. Okay. See you later.